From the Old Testament today, we're going to read Psalm 13. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death and my enemy will say I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation and I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. Our reading from the Gospel of Matthew today, we're in chapter 10. Actually, during the message, we're going to talk about all of chapter 10, but it was a little long to read. So what happens in these verses before these ending verses is Jesus sends the 12 disciples out into the community. He gives them instructions on kind of the work he wants them to do, um, what to do depending on how they're received, and some more detailed teaching about that. And he concludes with these verses from verses 40 through 42. Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. And this is the Lord of God. This is the word of God. So our job before us this second Sunday of Lent is to look at this section of teaching material. Remember during Lent we're going to look at each one of the five sections of teachings in the Gospel of Matthew. And this is known as the community discourse, encompasses all of chapter 10. And in it, you know, we'll find some things that probably don't surprise us, but really we're going to find some things that at first glance you know, may not be exactly what we expect. So I love a tool called the Abington Worship Annual. It's where a lot of our liturgy comes from. It gives a lot of information about lectionary scriptures. These scriptures we're using today are lectionary scriptures. They're just not prescribed for this particular Sunday. But in its discussion, it says, um, you know, with these scriptures, we're called to examine what we are holding in our heart and how what we're holding in our heart relates to our relationship with God. So we're going to start in Matthew 10 with verse 37. It said, Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. You know, a verse that when we read that section of scripture sometimes takes us by surprise. You know, it makes us scratch our head a little bit. We're not really sure what to do with it. But really, it doesn't say, you know, don't love your father or don't love your mother, don't love your children. You know, what it says is place me first. That in our hearts, the first place goes to God. So if any of you are familiar with Walk to a Mass or Chrysalis Weekends, um, a 72-hour retreat that will focus on lots of different areas of Christianity, this is one of the things they'll talk about at some point during the weekend, is that when we put God first and make God primary in our lives, you know, we automatically become a better child, a better parent, a better spouse, Um, that we let nothing take the place of God in our hearts. You know, even the good things in our life, that, you know, it becomes problematic if we elevate them so much that then they take place over God instead of being a gift from God. You know, then we get everything in our lives out of balance because everything is meant to flow out of the love of God. 
So you know by now I love to quote the two greatest commandments, um, keep them forefront in my mind. So in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 22, it tells us, you know, when Jesus is asked what is the greatest commandment, he said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And then Jesus says this is the first and the greatest commandment. And then he says the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. So the first and greatest is to love God wholeheartedly with everything that we are and everything we have, and then go out and love others. You know, so it tells us, among other things, this section that why we're doing what we're doing matters. You know, our motivation is important. It's what we hear in 1 Corinthians 13. Every time I quote that scripture, I can't help but think, yes, the one we talk about that we read so often in weddings, that's really about so much more than weddings. Um, It starts off the first couple of verses. It says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, And if I have faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, then I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. So we have this list of incredibly wonderful things, incredible gifts and admirable qualities But it says, if any of it is used or done without love, it means nothing. You know, if I give all I possess to the poor and give my body over to hardship, without love, I have nothing, that's a powerful statement. You know, that we gain nothing, that why we do what we do is important. So in this community discussion in Matthew, we're called to start first and foremost out of love, the love of God and the love of Christ. You know, and then it says the 12 disciples are sent out. You know, they're called to go, to go where their intended audience is, to go and be among the people. You know, Jesus gives them authority to do certain things, and then he sends them out to work. You know, so many of the things that we have looked at recently start with that word go. You know, Abraham, to go to a land that I will show you. You know, our discussion of Moses, God says, go to Pharaoh and bring my people out of Egypt. You know, the Greek commission starts with go. Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. I think sometimes this little two-letter word gets overlooked. Um, You have the importance of that instruction to go. You know, that I don't believe we were ever meant to solely exist inside the walls of the church. You know, in Matthew 10, Jesus tells the twelve to go to where the lost sheep of Israel are. You know, that there are those that are lost, and his instruction is to go to them. Tell them that the kingdom of God has come near. And then he says, show them the kingdom of God. You know, do my work in their presence. He tells them to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cleanse those that have leprosy and to drive out demons. You know, he tells them, go and do kingdom work. Go to the lost and show them me. You know, be a witness to me. You know, and there are many around us all the time that are lost. They're lost, but they're important. They're lost, but not inconsequential. You know, in a couple weeks, we're going to talk about Jesus leaving the 99 to go and find the one that is lost. I I don't know if any of you have ever had the pleasure of hearing Bishop Violet Fisher preach. I forget what annual conference she was bishop of, but she came out of Dorchester County. 
and she is a firecracker. She will have you like engaged from the moment go until she is done and usually have you like wanting more. And the first time I heard her preach was at a homecoming service and it, she referenced the little ad that came on before the 11 o'clock news. It's 11 o'clock. Do you know where your children are? And uh, she says a lot of our churches might meet around 11 o'clock in the morning and do we know where our children are? You know, do we take the time to look around in church and see who's not there? And then how do we reach them? What are we doing out there to reach the people that we're not getting in here? Um, There are people out there that will only be reached by the act of us going and being among them. You know, listening to them and getting to know them, you know, meeting needs, loving people with the love of Christ. And, you know, when opportunities arise, because they will, then be prepared to tell them about Christ. The simple act of going will bring about opportunities that don't happen when we solely invite people in. And, you know, inviting people in is part of who we are and part of what we do. I'm not saying that's bad, but that can't be the only part of the equation of what we do. Um, What we see as church work can't be confined to the church building. You know, we hear it over and over again in Scripture. We remember that the simple act of going with the love of God that is primary in our lives can make a difference in all that we do and in those around us. So in this whole idea that this work we're called to in chapter 10 doesn't always look as we would expect it to, you know, we read that chapter and we're also told we're relieved of the responsibility of how people will respond. You know, so much of the time we judge success and failure in terms of results. But the reading out of Matthew 10 says, go where you're welcomed. You know, and if you're welcomed, give your peace and stay a while. And if you go and you're not welcome and they won't listen to you, then leave and shake the dust off your feet. You know, it's the instructions are simple that it's not, it's not your responsibility how someone will respond. Um, So we go with the love of Christ and the gifts of God, desiring to be among people to be a reflection of the love that we know, um, a visible sign of the kingdom of God. And we let go of our need to control how someone else responds. You know, we're going to talk this Lenten season about the importance of planting seeds, but we're reminded that we are to be faithful to who and whose we are And that is not measured by someone else's response. So all of this, we're told in the scripture, is hard work. Jesus told the disciples in this chapter, I am sending you out like sheep among the wolves. Um, That's a scary verse every time I read it. But often there's this perception that if you're doing God's work, it should be easy. But Jesus says from the very beginning that it's hard work. He tells them, be on guard. You know, it's that whole section of scripture can be summed up by saying people are going to betray you and hate you and you'll be arrested and persecuted. And after laying out what that looks like to them, he tells them, but don't be afraid of them. For there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. He says, what I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. And what is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body. So in our Bible study in Acts a few weeks ago, we read about one of the first times that the disciples were arrested and beaten and then set free. And one of the first things they did when they were set free was they gathered together and they worshiped and they prayed and they prayed not for their safety, which I think is what I'd be tempted to pray for, but they prayed that they would continue to be bold in sharing God's word. 
You know, this scripture today out of Matthew calls us to be bold. What I tell you in the dark, then go speak in the daylight. And what is whispered to you, go and proclaim from the rooftops. You know, don't stop, but don't have the misconception that it's always going to be easy. So we go with eyes open, not with the expectation of ease, that there will be trying times, maybe not as much as for the disciples, but that we're not supposed to fool ourselves. There will be times of resistance or sabotage or trials, but the importance of not stopping being the person that God has created us and gifted us to be. Don't lose the love of Christ that's in the midst of it. You know, maybe that in all the things we've discussed, they're not the things we'd first expect, but we're told that it's worth it. We hear the unexpected words at the end of Psalm 13. So, you know, Psalm 13 starts and they're crying out to God, you know, how long? It talks about feeling forgotten and hidden. But then they say, but I trust in your unfailing love and my heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for God has been good to me. We're reminded in that final summary of the thoughts of Matthew 10 about who we welcome and who welcomes us. It says anyone who welcomes you welcomes me and anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. So we go, welcoming the people we encounter, inviting them to welcome us, knowing that then they will be welcoming the one who sent us. Amen.